and welcome to uh, the first uh, RITMO seminar of the season. Today we have with us uh, Julian Kaskel. Um, we're very fortunate uh, to have Julian with us today. He studied musicology, philosophy and political sciences at the universities of Heidelberg and Köln. His PhD from 2018 uh, was on scherzo movements in the 19th century, and his, he earned his habilitation in 2017. And uh, this habilitation ended up uh, like this from 2020. So it's here for perusal, if you're curious afterwards. Um, Julian is currently a substitute professor at the Folkbank University of the Arts in Essen. His publications include work on empirical performance research, music theory and intermedial music aesthetics, as well as on music history from Haydn to the present. His um, latest research project covers the topic of music and climate change, and his latest publication as editor um, is if I may attempt uh, uh, an English title, uh, entitled Software Supported Interpretation Research. So today we're promised a paper uh, of some critical depth. It's entitled Theories of Rhythm in the 20th Century, The Critique of Meter and a Critique of this Critique. Um, as always, the paper will be uh, followed by questions and comments from the floor. Um, but for now, please join me in welcoming uh, Julian Kaske. Okay, hi there. Thanks for the invitation and the introduction. I hope you can hear me. Um, this will be a paper basically also about translating rhythm in two senses. In the wider sense, it will be translating the research you do at Rhythmo, empirically, psychology oriented, a lot of popular music, into another discussion and another debate on rhythm that are more philosophically, that are coming more from cultural studies and might be much more known in German-speaking countries. Um, and in a narrower sense, it will also be about translating rhythm in the fact that already the translation from a German to an English version of the same text can really be tricky with the terminology we're using in rhythm research. And since I have to do that uh, in preparing my slides, um, we will talk about that a little as well. And so we just start by diving into the philosophy of the 20th century with one of the more famous quotes from that time. This is from Wittgenstein, Philosophical Investigations. Many of you will know this. The meaning of a word is its use in the language. So what we are interested here, of course, is the meaning of the word rhythm. And what I will try to do in the first minutes of my presentation is discussing the use in the language of this word rhythm. And I will focus on scientific publications, on philosophers and cultural theories, but there might be a possibility to um, widen that to common language theory and to more everyday experiences. So, for instance, um, it was mentioned in the introduction, here's a quote from the recently deceased um, sociologist and cultural historian Bruno Latour. Um, in the last decade, he was also very well known as a climate activist, and this is from a recent publication, an interview with him, where he states something, um, was at the end of this thick book, where I was surprised that he mentions the word rhythm. So let's read it together, and I will read the English version. There's a German translation. I know that there's some German speaking here in the audience, so you might also use the German version, of course, but I will stuck to the English version when I read. In the characteristic of your planetary, we have to factor in the rhythm of history. So the primordial earth, by definition, is always the same, the same village, church bells, there is no history. Of the global, we know the rhythm. It had to move forward, and we had this expression, which sounds strange today, the acceleration of history. So we notice that uh, very renowned scientists, maybe more renowned than all we here in the room together, um, is using the word rhythm very specifically, but in a very different sense that we might be used to in empirical rhythm research. 
So there are at least two levels in this single quote that I would like to put apart. On the first level, there's the difference of past and present. So in the past, there is a rhythmically or organized society. So the church bill, the village, it's rhythmically organized in the way that day and night, the hours um, are, well, in a kind of natural way, guided by a rhythmical change of events. And in the present, due to technical um, innovations and developments, the present usually is considered less rhythmical. This is no exclusive sort of Bruno Latour. You find the same thing, for example, by the very influential Hartmut Rosa, a socialist from a sociologist from Germany. Um, so the idea here is you see for the present he uses a tempo designation, acceleration. It's faster. That's the main ingredient of the present. But on the second level, there's also um, the difference between past and present. So this is a rhythm in itself. There's a rhythm of history, he says, and that's a rhythm of changing from the past to the present. And the problem here, of course, is it's the same word, and it's used in the language, but it's, it's really the same word as when we say rhythm in music analysis, music theory, ethnological research, and so on. Obviously, what I will talk today um, is how similar or dissimilar is this use of the word. So let's have a little bit of my own theory first. Um, there might be three ways to where this word, how these words interact, rhythm and meter. It's not about importance, it's about the way they interact in single texts. Um, so there can be more rhythms than meters, there can be more meters than rhythm, and there can be about the same amount of meter and rhythm simply in the way, again, you use it in the language. Um, so if we follow Wittgenstein and just show, look, where is this word used? Um, the first one could be a historically orientated research. Um, we could simply um, distinguish between metric rhythm and not metric rhythm. In Germany, there's the word malic rhythm for this. It covers Gregorian chant, music of the Middle Ages. Of course, you could just uh, also distinguish simple rhythms that are metrically organized from more complex rhythms that lose this metrical clarity and organization, and then we are in avant-garde music of the 20th and 21st century. Um, you all know this kind of research from the idea that there is um, there's rhythm without meter, but there's no meter without rhythm. So we are used to saying that. There are things that have rhythm, but they don't have meter. But if you have meter, usually you also have rhythm. And therefore, there's more rhythm than meter that we can describe and cover. And, but in music theory and music analysis, usually it's about the same. I'm thinking of publications like Cooper Meyer's um, rhythm, book on rhythm and meter, or later Chakendorf's generative theory of tonal music. So we are now in a systematic um, approach from the common practice period. Usually, you have a music example, you have a rhythm analyst, you have a metric analyst. You have both things for every piece of music that you analyze in this um, repertoire. And therefore, it's about the same amount of information that is um, um, used for describing rhythm and describing meter. And then you, of course, need uh, to distinguish it. Two very famous distinctions I have brought with. So um, this would be Lerdal Chekendorf. I guess you all know that. So rhythm is grouping structure. It's about making groups of notes or events. And meter is accent structure. It's about accented and non-accented events. Um, and Justin London, in his book on, on musical rhythm, would uh, refine this and say rhythm is phenomenal. It's really events that happen in time and places, and you can hear them. Meanwhile, meter is more psychological. It's about um, the perception or projection of these events, of, about entrainment, and so on. But still, you can have a music example and describe it in both ways. Um, the most complicated is the third form. Um, Maybe rhythm and meter here kind of collapse or collide into something different or something strange or something else. That's what I'm about to talk today. Um, 
Rhythm would be quasi metrical cycles, so the idea here is cyclicism, the rhythm of seasons, the rhythm of history of past and present, um, the rhythm of the human life, all these more metaphorical terms where we use the word rhythm are in this search bunch where you just cannot tell apart, is it rhythm, is it meter? It, on the one hand, it's very regular, obviously, otherwise I couldn't describe it as a cycle. On the other hand, it's not, no more linked to musical events, to sounding events that we can perceive, and therefore it's more metaphorical and more difficult to describe. The important point is, at least in German-speaking countries, we find it everywhere in the extant literature, both in more um, literature from former times and in very recent literature. Um, in order to prove my point that this kind of using the word rhythm in the language exists, I will now bring to you two random examples. Please take the word random very literally. It's the last two things I stumbled about last week. So I decided I just take the last two things I stumbled about uh, in the last couple of days. Um, the first one would be a very classic text, at least in Germany we all know that if you study musicology, I don't know how it's here, at least it was translated into English. It's by Karl Dahlhaus, Grundlagen der Musikgeschichte of Foundations of Music History. This is also the first time I can comment a little on the English translation. Um, I will again read to you the English translation of the central term where Dahlhaus is discussing uh, in a chapter on structural history maybe music history is rhythmically organized, which is especially interesting because obviously music history has risen in other areas too. So he discusses this rather at the end of this book in two pages. And this is a central paragraph, okay. The structures, be they institutions, modes of thought or patterns of behavior that coexist at any given time, interacting to constitute or determine an historical circumstance, differ from each other not only in respect of the age, i.e. how far back they extend to the past and the time spent allotted to them, but also in the rate at which they alter. That would be a rhythmical idea, the rate of alterations. Um, Fernand Prodel, a member of the Annales Circle, spoke of the various rhythms of coexisting structures ranging from the geographic conditions of a culture to the styles of its art. And to use a musical metaphor, there is a cause to doubt as the overlapping tempos can be reduced to a common underlying meter. So Wilhelm Pinder felt that succession of generations formed a certain natural rhythm to the history of art. Using Aristotle's definition of time as a measure of motion, there is, strictly speaking, no such thing as time in the singular, a homogeneous medium bending, events of various durations and rates of change, but only times in the plural, the times of overlapping structures in the conflicting rhythms. Okay, you see why this is a tough talk for you and me as well, um, because these are complicated quotes. Um, this is very dense prose, um, but it's very important, at least for German musicology. Um, therefore, I will not go into detail here, but I will just mention two things. Um, first thing, you also see with Stallhaus a conflation of terms. He uses the term rhythm and meter, but then also tempo. Um, so it's not quite clear if it's really a rhythm or not. Um, he puts it into single quotes and says it's not literally meant, but at the end of the paragraph, he forgets to use these quotes for one single time. So it kind of changes into a real musical rhythm there. Um, the second point I would like to say that Dahlhaus is not in favor of this theory. He critiques it, um, criticizes it. And another point is um, comparing the German um, original version with the English translation. You also might notice that um, in the German version it's called Zeitrhythmen, time rhythms. You could translate that very easily into English, but still the English translation decides just to call it rhythms and not time rhythms. So there is really a shift in the translation that um, this way of distancing it from the musical term of rhythm is still reduced a little. 
But of course that's okay because time rhythm or zeit rhythm is also obviously not a very ideal term because it feels tautological. Obviously rhythms happen in time and so just to call it zeit rhythm doesn't make clear that we're now talking about the rhythm of history and no longer about musical rhythms. So what you can see here is we have a problem here with the use of the word rhythm in the language. Um, Second example would be a collection of essays published in the same publishing house as my book, but three years earlier. This is kind of the first book that I couldn't cover in my own research because it closed in 2017. Um, it's a collection of essays from very, various disciplines. Um, Resonance, Rhythmus, Synchronisierung, Interaktionen in Alltag, Therapie und Kunst. You also notice it might be different areas than your research here at Rhythm in Oslo, but again, it, it's, there are connections, and you see the basic idea that you can use rhythm to bring together various people from various disciplines, from various academic backgrounds to talk about a common issue. Here, they decided to use um, therapies or a medical uh, approach and um, art um, and so on. And what they, of course, of course, do in the introduction is to define rhythm. Um, you see a longer German quote if you're interested in it, but I will, again, um, reduce myself to the English translation. And this is my translation, therefore it's not very good. Um, but it might work uh, um, as well here. Generally speaking, one consider as rhythm every regular temporal change of elements in an overarching course of events. For instance, the rhythm of day and night. Maybe just stop here. You notice that they use in their definition our third category, a quasi-regular cycle that is outside our musical experience. Here it's day of night, not the rhythm of history, but the um, rhythm of um, the daily periods of, of a day. But then they continue and transcribe this um, definition into a more musically and more narrow space of um, terminology. Therefore, in music, the term designates somewhat more specifically the outline of musical segments following a certain metrical scheme. And you see now we switch to our second category. We basically have rhythm and meter as two equally important categories to describe a rhythmically organized music. Um, And so that's a problem with this collection of essays and that's the reason why I wrote my book um, in the first place, that you always feel that there is a confusion in the terminology, that there are many different ways to use the word rhythm that here are um, conflated into single paragraphs or sentences at important points as it is the definition that shall guide the complete collection of essays. And if this is corrupt, corrupted in some way, it feels not nice academically. And therefore, I had the feeling that we, you need to kind of correct this and at least make yourself clear what you are doing when you use the word rhythm. Um, so um, we are relatively finished with the first hard theoretical part. I will leave myself. You can too. Um, we come to music just in a few minutes. Um, But we have to return to Wittgenstein first, um, because also this quote, at least you should quote the complete sentence, and then it's already a bit different. Um, for a large class of cases, so not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, it can be defined thus the meaning of a word is its use in the language. You see that Wittgenstein, who is not known to be extremely full of humor, is here doing a little bit of wordplay because in the first half of the sentence he says it's about the word meaning, the single word, but in the second half it's suddenly about every word and its meaning, and so he, he changes the direction of, of, the, of his argument in, in this single sentence. And the other thing, of course, is that he says, so not for all. And my basic idea is that rhythm could be one of those words that doesn't fit into this um, scheme of description. In other words, um, maybe the meaning of rhythm isn't its use in the language. Maybe we use it in the language in a very weird or scrambled or not so precisely defined way because we don't need to, because we have other areas of research where we can be more precise. So in performance research, in empirical research, and so on. 
Therefore, my alternative would be um, for a large class of cases, so not for all, in which we employ the word rhythm, it can be defined thus, the meaning of a rhythm is its use in a musical performance. This would be my offer to you to say, um, on the one hand, basically we're talking about musical rhythm or aesthetic rhythm, artistic rhythms, and then we have our own devices, our own tools to make um, a lot of um, scientific research that um, covers all these aspects of performance-based rhythm. But there are other cases, the cases that I have described and presented to you um, in the first minutes of my speech, where the word rhythm obviously is separated from a musical performance, where it is used in this more metaphorical way, in this more general way, and we can make these everyday connections like rhythm of the seasons, rhythm of day and night, and so on. And Basically, for the rest of my talk, um, we can, or, well, in the first place, we can then discuss if you agree or disagree with that. Obviously, there both is possible. And in the second place, we can and should discuss do we need these other cases? So, um, do we need the scientific literature, especially in German speaking countries and also in France? It's really very um, visible and important. Um, where rhythm is used in this way, outside of musical performance research, outside of music theory, do we need it or can we skip it? And maybe a bit of both, of course, is the answer, but that's the problem here. The problem, in a way, is if you really, to, to put it bluntly, if you start to study musicology or a related topic in Germany and you want to specialize on the topic of rhythm, the most books you will find in your library are about those other cases. We don't have so much recent publications about empirically or performance-related rhythm research. That's a very international thing. And so the German students will basically find books where it is used in this more metaphorical way. And then, of course, the question is, shall I go along this path and contribute to it, or shall I switch pathways and find a more empirical, systematic um, approach, which I personally prefer, but that's my personal opinion and not a scientific fact. Um, and or is a kind of middle of the road approach that can combine these two things. Um, and now back to the title of my talk, the critique of meter and the critique of this critique. Um, the point here is that if you use rhythm in these more general terms and push back from a musical perspective, Normally, then you separate rhythm and meter. You say rhythm is the thing that we find everywhere, and meter is this kind of thing that is used in certain types of analysis but could be skipped. Um, so the critique of meter very much is coming also from these other cases. Um, because in musical scores and musical performances of classical music, of, of European, these, um, European origins, Usually you still have bar lines, usually you still have a conductor coordinating the piece, usually you have some kind of meter. Um, I've brought just a musical example to make this clear. I have researched a little bit on this piece. It's rather well known in the history of avant-garde music of the 20th century, which doesn't mean that you have all to know it. Um, it's by a composer, um, you see it above the score, Isang Jung. Um, He's coming from South Korea, but then settling in Germany for many decades, living in Berlin. And it's his breakthrough piece at Donau Eschingen, the Musiktag, a Weak for Orchestra, performed, first performance in the 1960s. Um, maybe we just listen to the first couple of measures. And the point that I can say the first couple of measures is of importance here.
in these first couple of measures, you always have musical events on the downbeat of the notated meter. So if you want to find the meter, for example, with sonic visualizer and performance research, you will find these events, you will find these onsets, and then can say this is a metrical piece in the first measures because I have events that I can use. But of course, the question is, it is really fields like meter, so if there is still perceived meter. Obviously, the bar lines have a reduced function only to organize the piece. They are also changing bar signatures. Um, so this is an in-between case and therefore an interesting case. We cannot say that it has no meter because obviously there is some organization left, but we also cannot say that it is completely metrical and that we kind of tap along with it and, and feel the beat and can get entrained to it. Um, so this is the difficulty here. It's actually, it's coming from my performance research. The point here is that the meters therefore can differ in different performances. So you can hear the cue or you cannot hear the cue. You can hear performance that tries to play it rather strict and with accentuation on these events and you can hear performance that ignores these kind of more weaker cues that are still there. And therefore, the basic message here is that it's very easy to get rid of a lot of matter and metrical organization. It's very easy to write more complex rhythm. It's very easy to write a bar line and then not put an event on the downbeat or something like that. Um, but it's very difficult to get rid of all of meter. So to get rid really of, of a completely non-metrical piece, especially if it's an ensemble piece of classical music that has to be performed. So that's the difficulty here. And therefore the tendency is, and you have to believe me kind of, and I'll read my book or for this little point is, that um, for this last problematic amount of meters that you don't get away from your research and from your theories, um, there you go back to this more metaphorical uses of the word rhythm and because there you can do it, there you can get rid of meter. Not in the pieces themselves, the music themselves itself, but in the theory um, that is um, accompanying it. For example, um, this would be a spectrogram view. I don't know if it's good, very good visible in Sonic Visualizer of the beginning of the piece and you can see that with the first um, onset markers, we really have events here where we can use the onset to see that might be the bar line. But you also see then that we have events where we don't have that. So basically the waveform tells us something different than the events that are notated on the downbeat. Um, so I've uh, marked here with these white brackets, there you have this drum roll where that can use to find the downbeat of this measure and you can see it in the visualization, but you also can see that would be the other bracketed thing that the melody is really placed inside and um, beyond the metrical scheme of the notated meter um, because it's just in the middle between two bar lines where this first melodic event starts. We can also listen to the recording this is taken from. This is a radio recording um, from 2017, I think, with the Hessische Symphony Orchestra. And the conductor is Peter Wundel. You can also double check, there is some orientation and organization in this piece, but you don't have the feeling of three to a, to a bar or four to the floor or something like that. There's obviously no, no beat scheme, no accentuation scheme that is a regular perceived meter. Um, but I should have brought this with me, but I skipped it for maybe even legal reasons. If you listen to this radio broadcast, the announcement before the piece starts tells you that this piece has no rhythm. Um, so it's an, because this is idea of the music of the 1960s, legacy, atmosphere, and, and this kind of stuff. So the announcement tells you what you will hear is an amorphous flow of sounds without any discernible rhythms and of course absolutely no meter. 
And then it starts with this percussive sound and you think, okay, um, maybe um, we have here two different ways to talk about these things. Um, um, so I double checked this myself and this is completely subjective. I just decided for every single bar of this piece if there is something at the downbeat. Um, so if it goes very up, I would say you can really use it psychologically to feel a downbeat there. If it just goes to the middle, there is a musical event, but there's no cue that this might be the downbeat. It could be also another event. So you can measure it, but you cannot feel it in the same way. But still what you can see is that the piece gets in a way less metrical or less rhythmically clear during the course of events. At the beginning, we have the most amount of organization and at the end we have only a slighter um, cues that guide us through this piece. And we also have um, longer areas where we really have amorphous sounds. So basically what you see here is, uh, that is very typical. You take a tiny bit of the piece and describes a complete piece from this tiny bit of the piece. Um, but still, there's a possibility um, to say, um, to um, sum this up, um, we can get rid of meter rather easily to a certain point, to a certain degree, but then it gets even more difficult to get rid of the conductor if you want to hear this piece, to get rid of coordination, to write it without bar lines, which just feels more complicated for the performers and so on. Um, and therefore, we are in the middle of the speech, so it's time for the commercial break for my own book on research on this topic. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Um, I only brought to you the first page because then it gets, starts to get complicated and I don't want to reread it or something like that. But um, the point here is, um, that I start with an initial thought that really was my initial thought. So basically, this is not a constructed introduction where I have some very clever theoretical schemes, but basically I say, why did I start with this in the first place? And the point is that I stumbled upon a kind of contradiction in the literature I have already shown you, the literature where rhythm is used in this more general, more philosophical sense. Um, this is again my first and a little bit altered translation, but you can double check it. For that, you have to buy the book. That's the idea behind this. Okay. Um, in the first half of the 20th century, a position that is both conservative and does criticize meter has dominated the debates on rhythm. So the Notable thing, especially in the 1920s, 1930s, in the extant literature, is that on a political level, on a philosophical level, it's really reactionary, it's conservative, it's not up to the front of analytical philosophy. It's a very irrational, romantic um, philosophy. Um, the German word would be schwärmerisch, um, so very, very long um, sentences, without a clear logical scheme, very, very subjective in its outlook. Um, so it's really not up to date. But what it does, it does criticize meter. At, at the same time where we have, of course, modern music starting um, in different form, both, well, Western avant-garde music with Schoenberg Stravinsky, but of course also the, the advent of jazz music in the 1920s and of um, Tin Pan Alley music and so on. And so it's really strange to see that these two um, areas of 20th century cultural history are so apart from each other. So that basically the series and theoretical texts you read, the books from this period with rhythm in the title you read will tell you a completely different thing than the music scores and the, or the sheet music that you have from this time, or the audio recordings, of course. So let's go on. Theory and practice of rhythm finally split. Aesthetic innovations aim for an irregular rhythmic design whose successions of accent and beats usually preserve a sometimes indirect relationship to the principles of a regulating meter. So um, this is, of course, the idea that we have for its sounds and uh, Stravinsky's music, where you have very irregular succession of rhythmic events, but you still have some kind of metrical organization um, that is necessary to produce it. Um, on the other hand, the contemporaneous series of a vitalistic philosophy, so the German word here would be Lebensphilosophie, that's the um, school of thought behind it, 
However, question modernities through a strictly purified conception of rhythm from which meter as a symbol of modern civilization and rational thought must be excluded. Um, so just a few comments on this. So the conception of rhythm is really purified in that sense that they say it's very regular. It's very simple. It's something every man can feel, not think about logically, but feel in their heart and souls. And then they will notice that they are that we are all rhythmic creatures, and therefore we are kind of, without a Christian God, we are kind of feeling at home in the universe because the universe is rhythmically organized as well. So that's the esoteric kind of thought that you have there. So, and for that you need a really simple conception of rhythm, without syncopations, without um, micro-timing, it's just rhythm. But it's not meter. It's not, not metered in, in accents and, and three to the bar, four to the bar, something like that. And they really try to separate these two things, um, to have a very simple concept of rhythm without meter. We are used to have complicated rhythms without meter and say, if the rhythm is simple, it is metered. If it's more complex, it might not have meter in the same way. But this is different in this literature. And therefore, just to confront it with the piece possibly you all know, this would be um, the beginning of the music of the 20th century, considering the rhythm in the analytic research. Um, these are the most analyzed eight bars of music history, perhaps, with some exceptions like um, the Mozart sonata with the beginning of the radiation team, or maybe the start of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or something like that. But there is a lot of literature on these eight notated measures that you all know. That's the beginning of the Allegro section in the first half or first section of Sacre du Printemps. Just for remembering you, we can hear. <laughs> In the number designations, this is all very, very basic stuff. Um, in, I think in rhythm research, the most prominent theory that describes this would be the terminology between a conservative and a radical reading of the rhythm, so a conservative reading that basically keeps to the notated measures that you have heard before. You, you are in this metrical scheme, but then it breaks apart, but you can try to keep to it. And there's a radical reading that just says, where are the, the accented beats? And that are my ones or my downbeats in a way. And there's a conflict between this. And the interesting thing here is that the radical composers prefer the conservative readings. Um, the most famous example is the analysis by Pierre Boulez. This is from the German version of Storinsky de Meur, where you basically see that his number or letter designations, A1, A2, B1, B2, it's just the bar lines. It's a notated meter that he uses to analyze the piece. He ignores the succession of accented beats. He just takes a notated meter and then makes something out of it. Something rather smart, which we haven't no time to discuss here. But the idea here is, again, the problem with a critique of meter is it's very easy to get rid of it to a certain extent. But then you see that even Boulez um, has to refer to it in his analysis and is rather surprisingly conservative in his way that he really keeps um, adherent to the notated bar in all his analytical stuff. You have the same thing with, with Cage in discussions in German music that he needs bar lines to a certain degree, even for aleator aleatoric procedures and so on. Um, in comparison, this is a reconstruction from the first performance in Paris 1913 with Nijinsky um, as the choreographer. It's on DVD, but I have a version from television, therefore it's not very good technically. I'm also sorry that Gergiev is the conducting, but you couldn't change that um, no more. And, but we're going into this moment, uh, and please basically look what happens on stage. Um, the new music is the same you've heard already.
maybe to this point, um, this, this should be enough. You can find it on DVD if you want to watch it um, and complete, possibly also online right now. But um, Okay, the interesting thing here for me, you might find other things more interesting, of course, is that at the first performance, really, the visual aspect of um, presenting this piece changes the conservative and radical readings of the meter in a way, because in the music, if you hear it as a concert piece, these accented beats are loud, they are perceived events. Meanwhile, the notated downbeats are silent beats. We can see them, but we cannot really hear them if we not only keep our, this metrical scheme in our minds. But on the stage, this um, skips because um, they do the notated meter as you have heard and seen with their feet. And therefore, you hear it really on the ground floor of the stage. You hear the notated beat. Meanwhile, these accented um, syncopated beats you only see in the head changes. They are now silent in a way, visually. So it's very interesting to see that this concept of rhythmic counterpoint that Stravinsky has uh, with the first performance is really realized through, uh, an, uh, through the combination of the visual and the auditive messages that are given here. But again, that's the lesson here is that maybe you can do more interesting things if you accept that you can, cannot get rid of all meter, but you can play with it and, and so on. Um, just uh, for comparison, this would be a solo ballet performance of this piece by a choreographer called Xavier Leroy. This is the commercial video from his homepage. There's unfortunately no full performance. The idea here is that he is dancing the complete Sacre du Printemps as an orchestral conductor. So he is doing conducting movements, but he is doing them to the audience, not to an orchestra. It's played by tape but the, the audience is conducted by him in this way. And you will see here now the opposite scheme that he skips with the downbeats and just brings the radical reading of the extended beats to the fore. And you see it's cut because we start with the first bar and then we switch. That's unfortunately the next cut in, in this commercial um, video, but, but basically you see here is that, um, to sum, summarize this in a very, very simple way, well, this is the most famous piece about rhythm from classical music from the first half of the 20th century, and what I have shown you in a very condensed form is that it is interesting because you really can react to it in very different ways. And all these ways have something to do with getting rid of a part of meter but keeping another part of it into um, performance. So critique of meter is possibly necessary and very helpful to a certain degree because it opens up options and gives us more free space to interact with the pieces. But it has to limit itself to a certain degree. There is a certain point where you cannot go further without kind of philosophical or theoretical problems because it's very difficult to get rid of it completely. Um, in comparison, the most quoted German philosophical text from the first half of the 20th century would be the work of Ludwig Klages from Wesen des Rhythmus. Maybe you have heard the name, maybe you have read the text, but I really can tell you that this is the most important uh, single, very small um, book on rhythm from the first half of the 20th century. If you just look the citation index, if there would be something in the first half of the 20th century. And it's completely the other way around, as I described it. It has absolutely nothing to do with the music of its time. And it's a philosophical conception that tries to define rhythm in the most simple and general way, but to get rid of meter. So um, again, these are my translations. Therefore, they're not very good, but hopefully they will work. Um, the confusion of rhythm and meter is one of a thousand ways of the age-old confusion between life and mind. Basically, he says in 1930s, um, 
There is no single text on rhythm that does not um, mix up rhythm and meter and doesn't confuse rhythm with meter. And I think if he would be the visiting guest right now, he would tell you the same thing about your work. You do this all the time. You think you speak about rhythm, in fact you speak about meter. That's your problem, I try to solve it for you. That's his philosophical idea. Back then there was more empirical research on rhythm back then than you would think in, in Germany. It was a flourishing area of labs working in this area and that's his criticism against. So he tries to use rhythm in a way to criticize natural sciences in comparison to humanistic approaches as well. There is, of course, since it is published 1934, also a political and ideological thing to it, um, but it's very complicated. He was no direct supporter of the National Socialists. Um, it's one of those reactionary thinkers that kind of were too independent to be completely immersed there, like... like um, um, Others have been, especially, especially for instance, Oswald Spengler with the decline of, of the Western civilization or Untergang des Abendlandes, so that's a similar case. It's complicated, but he also was definitely no supporter of the Weimar Republic or democratic culture. And so, um, what he says here, rhythm is a general phenomenon of life on which, as a living creature, man participates. So this must be simple and very general to, to claim this. Meter, however, is a human effort. Rhythm can appear in perfect shape with complete absence of meter, but meter cannot appear without participation of a rhythm. You see here again, the second half of the quote would be my first category of description of rhythm and meter. There's more rhythm than meter in a very simple way. The first half of the quote would be more my other um, area of how to use the word because it is a very general way that it's all over the universe and then obviously we don't talk about musical rhythm anymore in this way. And so the most famous definition from this text, meter does repeat the same, but for rhythm one must say that it is a return of the similar. And since the return of something similar in relation to that gone is, in, is its renewal, we may say in shortened form, meter repeats, rhythm renews. And this, in a way, doesn't sound so wrong. Um, it doesn't sound so false. It sounds rather modern, even, because you can see that basically here the idea is that rhythm has irregularities of micro-timing, of temporal accents that makes it a living thing of um, singular events, performances, and so on. Meanwhile, meter is just an abstract theoretical scheme that we can use in the same way for, way for every piece. And so the problem, again, is that we cannot just get rid of this and say this is so old, this is so ideological, we just can't forget it. Because the thoughts inherent to it are still usable to a certain extent and are still important for the way we try to catch up with these things. Um, you can also see this, and this is really a very condensed one-hour YouTube course. Obviously, in, uh, uh, in a university course, we would take more time. So we skip to the second half of the 20th century, and here's the most quoted passage, to my knowledge, about criticizing meter and saying rhythm is better than meter. We have to get rid of meter, but can keep up with rhythm would be from um, Deleuze, Guattari, um, Capitalismus und Schizophrenie, Tausend Plateau, Mil Plateau. This is also very often quoted. I have double-checked these translations through Google Books and other online sources, and you find, find really dozens of quotes from this single line. So basically everyone writing about rhythm has quoted this already or will in the near future. Um, so basically, maybe, and I have to prepare for that because my French is very bad, and we have to start with the French original version here because now I would like to mention for the second time the problem of translating rhythm and the use of rhythm in the language. On sait bien que le rythme n'est pas mesure aux cadences, même irrégulière, rien de moins rythmé qu'une marche militaire. Le tam-tam n'est pas un, deux, le valse n'est pas un, deux, trois, la musique n'est pas binaire ou ternaire, mais plutôt euh, 47 temps première comme chez les Turcs. Also, das ist ungefähr das französische Zitat. I'm sorry, I switched into German. <laughs> you see, it's very difficult to keep my languages apart right here. Okay, um, what I should say before, just before this quote, they say, meter is dogmatic, rhythm is not. 
So meter is a problem for our philosophy, rhythm is not, and so, so on. And so maybe two points here. The first problem is that the French words mesure and especially cadence have completely different meanings in the French language than if we try to translate them into English or German. Cadence is something that has to do with um, verbal prose. It's like in German we would say Reimschema. It's a metered scheme of, of rhyming or syllable counting in accented prose. And therefore, the irregular has another meaning because it is much more usual in um, a course on written poetry to say there is irregular meter. I mean, in poetry, it's very obvious that we say it should be a yambus, but it is a trocheo, so it's a bit irregular and so on. This is very obvious. It's much more obvious than in musical meter. So the problem here is that in the first language sentence, they talk a little bit more about language and a little bit less of about music than you might think. And then maybe we go on with the English translation, which is really, really bad. And I can tell you that, but it's easy to explain because... These are thousand pages of dance philosophy. You don't take a musicologist to translate it. You take someone who knows about philosophy and cultural history and so on. And therefore, maybe it's not surprising that they kind of get mixed up with the musical terms here. Um, it is well known that rhythm is not meter or cadence, even irregular meter or cadence. It's already a bit problematic to repeat that here. It's not repeated in the original. There is nothing less rhythmic than a military march. This is a sentence we all understand. You can also discuss a lot about this sentence. It only makes sense if you say a military march is meter. It's not rhythm, because obviously there is regularity in it. You have coordination in it. You have downbeats in it. So why is it not rhythmical? Because there's no micro timing. There are no living irregularities and so on. So you have to say a military march is the most metered form of music and therefore the least rhythmic. So this again, this critique of meter. Basically, you also can say if you're a really, really important philosopher, it's not more necessary to put on footnotes in your texts. Um, you can just um, write something from someone else and not mention the name. This sentence you will find literally in the writings of Messiaen, Olivier Messiaen on rhythm. So it's an idea of Messiaen that is coming here into this text. And um, no, the interesting thing is that here really stands the tom tom is not one two. Again, we can stop. The tom-tom and the tam-tam are two different instruments. They have changed the instrument in the translation. A tom-tom is a drum. It does do rhythmic percussive onsets. A tam-tam is a huge gong, a death cymbal, which produces continuous amorphous sounds. So the punchline of saying it is not one, two completely changes when you change the instrument, obviously, here. Um, in, in the first place, the punchline is that the word tam-tam suggests one, two, but it really does not produce this kind of sounds. If you say a tom-tom is not one, two, you say that you really have to do refining your rhythm research to find micro-timing or something and say it's something else like that. Um, and the waltz is not one, two, three. Music is not binary or tenory, but rather 47 basic meters as in Turkish music. And here you have the next problem because obviously ton premier is not basic meters. Um, they could have written mesure premier or something like that, but there's ton premier in French, which is very difficult to pin down what they mean with that. But it's not basic meters as uh, it is stated here. So that's the next problem here. Um, and maybe... Just for fun, the German translation. Um, Bekanntlich ist der Rhythmus weder Maß noch Kadenz. Er ist nicht mal eine unregelmäßige Kadenz. Nichts hat weniger Rhythmus als ein Militärmarsch. Das Tamtam -Tam ist hier wieder richtig. Uh, white Instrument um, ist nicht 1, 2. Der Walzer ist nicht 1, 2, 3. Und Musik ist nicht binär oder ternär, sondern hat wie in der türkischen Musik eher 47 verschiedene Formen von Tempo Primo. But tempo primo in the end is not ton premier because tempo primo is just a usual phrase from classical music of the 18th century. Um, it means you, you can find it in scores in the way of ritardando, tempo primo, um, accelerando, tempo primo, and so on. It's a, it's a standing, very strict term um, that is um, replaced here for the original French and therefore you, you again have a corrupted version of the idea. So again, the idea would be it's easy to criticize meter and also helpful and necessary maybe, but the very last few steps are 
really difficult and you start to stumble and you start to uh, fall down and you also notice it in these translations because it's really difficult to find an adequate designation. So um, to return to here, I think what happens here, but I cannot prove it at this point, is that uh, Tom Premier, 47 Tom Premier, I think that Deleuze and Guattari here kind of mix up the tonal system of oriental music, the makam system of so and so on, scales, um, and with a metrical and temporal scheme of music. Um, because it would be much easier to say that there are 747 makams or tonal schemes in Turkish music or oriental music or whatsoever than really to find this kind of temporal organization. And therefore, it is really impossible to translate Tom Premier in a correct way. Um, because in the end, you notice that it's again wordplay um, 47 first times. So either it are 47 or the first times. Um, Either it's tempo primo, you have a primary thing, or you have 47 of it. That's, that's a problem here. But that's their idea behind it. They want to get you into this trap in order so that you get out, and that's a problem here. Okay, I've talked a lot, therefore we come to a conclusion, um, maybe just with one last example of translating rhythm. This is another piece. Um, was first performed, and I think uh, the first performance was also the final performance. It's one of these new music pieces where you only have one performance. Um, but it's on YouTube, um, and you get the score. It's by a Finnish composer. His name is Eero Hemenjemi. He kind of was interested in Stockhausen, and but then turned to Indian music. And so you can read maybe the word Tilana about the third movement of this piece. So again, you have here the idea to translate rhythm to translate Indian um, Tala and Raga rhythms and uh, tonal systems into a score of Western European classical music. And basically, I don't know how good you can see this, so I have to double check. Okay, not very good, but not very bad either. Um, so what you can see is that there are obvious regular metered events here. You see the bar lines, you see that certain parts really stick to it. So this is conventionally metered music. But you also see other things, for instance, the cello piece uh, or cello voice down there, where you see it's more irregular, where it's really uh, an inter interesting scheme that feels more like Stravinsky's eight bars in the way where the rhythm is. And so um, the point here is, again, that translating rhythm in musical performative times also is very easy. You just combine some European elements with some Indian elements. Some find it very tasteful, some find it very problematic. You can discuss this, of course, from ethnological terms. Um, maybe in order to give you a, a nice um, final audio and video example, we just hear one minute of it, and you see it's a very famous in Indian singer that adds vocalizations. We just hear, listen to the piece to the point where also a dancer will appear on stage, and again, visualizing the rhythm. Um, the point here is that, again, in the visual YouTube video, you also have a kind of directing your perception of me to do the um, more usual things. For instance, you will see the contrabassoon player who makes this, so it's very regular what he plays. And in the end, so I will try to um, put together these two um, basic ways of describing it that I have presented in my speech, but just to say to this video and audio examples, um, again, there is a conservative way to hear it. You are oriented metrically all the time. It's very easy to hear metrically or rhythmically. Uh, but there's also a radical way where you can see that always they are happening a little more than just the regular things. There are also things that are against it, that are syncopated, that are unpredictable, and therefore, it's really the, the attractive thing of putting rhythm and meter together is that you also can put in these more advanced and more restrained ways of listening together. And what we must accept is that we get rid of meter completely. We also get rid of these possibilities of putting different listening strategies together. So just listen to that, but it's also thought as a kind of relief after this philosophical talk.
Maybe a little too long example, but I would want to come to the point where the dancer then is again adding another layer of information if you analyze it, where you also can then take rhythmic information and metrical signals from this kind of performing it. Maybe also a little too long a speech here, but so let's sum it up very short. Um, do we need a critique of meter from this more philosophical viewpoints? Maybe yes, because we in fact might sometimes intermix the terms or might think that we're talking about rhythm, meanwhile we also talk about meter. Do we need a critique of this critique? I think again, yes, we do need it because what I have shown you is that it's difficult to translate a rhythm on the one hand. It might also be very simple if you just mix up different cultures of rhythm and performance, but um, we do need this criticism basically because it's very easy to get rid of certain kinds of metrical organization, but even more difficult to get rid of all kinds of this organization. If we try to, we come up with a conception of rhythm that has been very influential in German-speaking countries and that I have shown you today, where you try to find a very pure rhythm completely without meter. What I would prefer, since I come from music of the 20th century and contemporary music, would be a little bit more complicated and multi-layered concept of rhythm, but the word multi-layered in itself shows us that we cannot get rid of meter then completely. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian, for an uh, eye-opening and uh, ear-opening uh, talk with lots of uh, wonderful examples, both uh, deliberate and random. <laughs> so we now have time for questions and comments, and I've put myself first in the line. So you challenged us about halfway through uh, the talk to think through your proposal uh, to... Uh, there's a statement that the meaning of... Uh, rhythm 
is its use in a musical performance. So uh, that was the sort of challenge. And at that point, I uh, looked in your book and I thought, have, have you read Christopher Small? Uh, what about the concept of musicking? Why the restriction to musical performance? So my sort of immediate response is, is exactly that. Uh, musicking, is there, is there space for that in that particular statement? Is it too, too broad? So musicking in Christopher Small's 1998 book refers to uh, our musical engagement, whether it's performance, uh, composing, uh, dancing, listening. So, yes, is that... I yeah. haven't quoted this text from Small basically out of, I don't know, because so many other people quoted, I didn't feel the need to do it uh, no more, um, but uh, obviously I'm fond of this concept. I think I would then say, of obviously the word musicking is again also a little bit of wordplay because we think about musing and so about the muses and about thinking about things. So music in not only has this performative dimension of action, but there's also kind of thought-related um, sound in, in, in this term, for me at least. And I think these, this, this would be the connection that um, if you think about rhythm and write written texts about rhythm, that's a question if this already is a form of musicking. It is a form of musing about, about thinking out things and putting things together. And so um, maybe my short answer would be that usually we use the term by Christopher Small of musicking to show that we are totally open to ex vast experiences. Yeah. But it's still restricted in a way. And maybe we can open up even further than that. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, yes? I'll be doing the running around. Yeah, thanks uh, for this uh, excellent, excellently entertaining talk. Uh, my question, first a little comment on uh, empiricism. Uh, I was struck by the uh, quote by Deleuze and Guattari on uh, there's no, nothing less rhythmic than a military march here. I, I guess it, this has to do with that uh, they never experienced uh, a military march. This would be my accusation. It reminds me of this other book by uh, McNeil on keeping in time together, a military historian who was himself trained in uh, drill, in military drill, and who reports as a kind of, I guess it's the opening anecdote of this book, uh, uh, reporting on this beautifully rhythmic experience he had while being drilled against this uh, image we get from, for instance, uh, a full metal jacket or other uh, uh, representations of uh, drill in anti-Vietnam War movies. So I would trust the empirical side here more. This might be a re reactionary <laughs> statement, but uh, okay. Well, my, my question goes towards the political. Uh, the, the, the critique of, the, of meter in the 1960s might have to do with the experience of fascism and it comes from kind of the left. Uh, so meter is, uh, might be associated with something uh, fascist to it. Uh, whereas in the 1930s you reported uh, that uh, the crit criticizers, the critics of meter in the, in the 20s and 30s came from people who themselves were at least, well, not leftist, uh, reactionaries perhaps. Uh, so do, do you see any continuity or uh, convergence or uh, what is the binding theme? Why, why, why does a political critique of Mieter, which I think it is, uh, come from uh, directions which uh, of, uh, at, at the surface level at least might uh, thought of as being opposed to political camps? Yeah, okay. Um, first point, military march. I'm of course with you. I also like this book you mentioned, Keeping Together in, in Time. It's also very often quoted. Obviously, um, a military march can be done in many different ways, and, and you can march to it in many different ways. And so this, this quote, again, uh, has of course this political dimension, so I think, as you do too, that we need this political dimension to really fully um, understand it. Um, 
purely empirical, musically, it's clear that also marching in, implies some kind of micro-timing and ritualistic experience, and you can really enjoy it. Um, and, and you also do not have to do it in military. Uh, you can also march kind of in a, a carnival or uh, hitchhiking or, or, or hiking in the mountains or whatever. And um, the political point here is, of course, a little more complicated. Um, there does not seem to be a direct lineage. Um, there are two possibilities here. The one is, of course, that um, the French philosophers that then are very influential, Deleuze, Foucault, uh, Roland Barthes, and so, and so on, or also Bruno Latour, they have been very influenced by German philosophers that might also be important for um, these thinkers of the 1920s, so basically Nietzsche, of course, who has also written a lot of on rhythm, and maybe then from later times Heidegger, and, and so on. And in the other way around, um, we also we know that Deleuze was very fond of the philosophy of Henri Bergson, and um, this might be an influence already in the 1920s, so the texts that both have read. And last thing to mention here, I see it as you do or have implied that sometimes we have this phenomenon that the politically left and the politically right um, seem to share some ideas and some agendas and try from different ways um, to make the same statements. And we see it right now politically um, that the left and the right can be um, united against uh, the middle uh, in, in some political agendas. And you have it maybe here too, that um, uh, reaction in the right, but which is not so completely fascistic and also an independent leftist sort have some common ground. We have two more on the list. Thank you. Um, yesterday I said uh, notation is the elephant in the room, uh, which I still think is, is present. Uh, the Isang Yun example is interesting because, as you clearly pointed out, the, the, the meter is, is kind of tricky. But if you look at it from an orchestral musician's point of view, it makes very good sense because, like uh, Ligeti score, where everything is in 4-4, and you drop out, you are lost. But here, when you have 5-4, four, 6-4, four, etc., you can still hook onto it. So it's, it's more a kind of coordinating principle from the conductor, which I think uh, Isang Yun was very pragmatic. But uh, another point, the, the, the Stravinsky notation, the, the uh, right of spring, if you take away the meters, uh, and just have a series of eight notes. What then? Uh, it would be interesting in terms of a more perceptual experiment to say that you have what's called uh, exclusive allocation in Gestalt theory, uh, which has been discussed quite a lot in, in rhythm theory, uh, six, eight versus three, four time. So you could actually test it out. And again, I think that this thing about notation symbols on paper is tricky. And to be a nasty skeptic, you should say, we should investigate this from a more empirical point of view to see whether it really has an effect on how people hear the music. Yeah, I, I agree with your point, but I also can see why it is again and again noteworthy or necessary to mention it because obviously I also come from a scientific culture where we overweight the notated text. That's obviously I do overweight the notated uh, text because I have taught, been taught to do so for 20 years and it's difficult. Again, you can get rid of it to a certain extent very easily and to say, yeah, there are also performances, so I compare different performances of the Yun piece. I try to take this perspective of a musician by tapping myself and say, where is the information and so on. But it's difficult then to really get rid of this, this biased perspective or com completely. And well, with the Stravinsky and the empirical research, um, it would really be 
interesting to write a complete history of the empirical algorithm research. I don't know if this is already existing because one should remind oneself that kind of the study designs you describe really have already been done in the 1920s, 1930s in Germany, at least from the direction where they tried to work with nonsense syllables and nonsense combinations of rhythm without bar lines and then with bar lines and of course all that you know from the um, catchphrase of subjective rhythmization, subjective rhythmizering is exactly the idea that these four groups, four note groups um, are a very intuitive thing to do. Um, so it's difficult to take it away. Um, if, you, if you take the bar lines away, you still might have this psychological principle to, to, to orient yourself in that, that way. And that's very old um, thinking about rhythm. So um, the, the interesting point here is that therefore the criticism of meter has not completely faded because it is already then a criticism directed against um, experiments in the lab that work not so totally different from what we are doing today. Thank you so much. Very interesting and thought-provoking uh, uh, lecture. So, um, but I, I, it just struck me that the critique of meter kind of comes from two different positions because the first one is uh, a position where you want to get rid of meter <laughs> Uh, completely, uh, at least in the. Of course, there. As I think you have a very good point uh, in pointing out that there is still meter because uh, there is some kind of organizing principle. But uh, at least from the contemporary art music scene in the 20th century, it seems that it's like meter. You try to get meter completely out of the music, whereas Deleuze. Um, is actually quite obsessed with meter in the sense that he is theorizing and kind of bringing back repetition as a very important uh, thing in music and in, in, in life and in, in general. So it seems that the, the, the second stance is more about transforming uh, meter into something else, something more vital or Organic, and one could read the um, the, the quote from from Thousand Plateaus uh, with the forty seven. Was it premier temps or temps premier? Yeah, I think. Yeah, should work. <laughs> <laughs> that it could be read as like forty seven repetitions, but that they just start anew every time you're doing the repetition. It's a new thing because not because something is changed, but is because time is new, and that would be a very kind of the Lucian way of thinking, I, I, I think. So that was just a comment, and please feel free to uh, comment back. And I, then I also have a kind of more of a question, and that's what, where is um, the phenomenon of free rhythm in music? How is that like fitting into your uh, theoretical framework? Uh, and free uh, yeah, rhythm yeah, then sure. in, the, in the sense of things that is not metrical, but it's repeatable. Yeah, I would say um, the direct question I can answer was simply not very well. It's a kind of weak spot. I should work out. It, should have worked out it better. Also in the book, I, I really felt it. Also that uh, I, I kind of was biting into one direction, and then you notice you have other phenomena that you cannot describe as well. And this is really a valid point. I think in digital communities you can kind of mix it up with this repeat idea because um, obviously now you can record it, a free rhythm, and then you can repeat it, and, and you, can, you can alter it and manipulate it and so on, and so maybe these new digital tools will, will be a way to bring it together more. And to Deleuze, I also would um, agree, um, first of all, this is what philosophy does. We're saying it's not one thing, it, it, at least two things that we should keep separate. So um, I completely agree that it's more transformation than uh, getting rid of it by, with Deleuze. It's again complicated. Um, if you want to, of course, um, Deleuze has also written difference and repetition as, as maybe his more major and mature work where he really puts his philosophical agenda in a more clear form than in his collaborative <sighs> works and so on. Um, in difference and repetition, for instance, the problem is that it's really a very difficult to understand text. Um, 
very dense prose. There are two or three popular quotes from it, and I just say this anecdotically to show where the problem is. Um, for instance, um, the Austrian composer Bernhard Lang, I, I really appreciate his work, he has written a lot of pieces that are called Difference and Repetition 1, Difference and Repetition 2, Difference and Repetition 47. So he takes this idea of repeating but producing something new in it. And well, he, he of course claims that he uh, is influenced by Deleuze and as a creative performer it's completely okay. But basically, he quotes one of those catchphrases Deleuze uses in his book on maybe page 224, because it's very good readable and sounds nice. Um, it's like there is no objective um, variation in repetition, but there is still subjective re variation in repetition, so I react differently to it when I hear the same thing. But Deleuze says on page 20, 207, three pages later, he says, that's not right. That's too easy. That's not my solution. But for, for the composer, it is a solution because it's still understandable. And so um, the problem here, again, is um, you have something very simple, repetition. And by repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, you make something very dense and complex out of it. And so Deleuze also is kind of musicking in this writing because he really uses this dance prose to prove his idea that you can make very, something very complex out of repetition. And so so I, I guess, um, yes, um, he's more transforming it than just getting rid of it. I completely agree. Yeah, I have uh, an observation, not, not a question, and it's related to what Rolf Inge brought up as well. Um, and the idea that it's hard to get rid of meter altogether. Um, particularly exemplified by the contrabassoon player in, in the video that you showed that in ensemble music and the need for them to play together and have a score where there's bar lines and things so that it can be coordinated that the musicians themselves, regardless of what it sounds like to the audience, it's very metric. I know that the, the time I had an opportunity to play the Rite of Spring in an orchestra that it was very metric according to the bar lines because I was counting like a devil the entire time through. Like, I was one, two, three, four, all the way through. So it was a very, very regular metric piece for me. I remember also um, when I was in university, and this might have been an urban myth, but uh, being told by a professor that there was uh, an ensemble that, that did uh, Least Proud of Soldat, um, and they rewrote the, man they rewrote the score um, so that it was all in four, four times so that they could play it without a conductor. And again, for the musicians, uh, then they were thinking very regularly in a 4-4 meter, even though the experienced music by the audience wasn't that at all. And so you, you can't escape. It's, in that case, it's imaginary meter inside their heads, but it's, you can't escape it if you're going to have ensemble music that's coordinated. Yes, I, I think I can answer very quickly on that. I, totally agree. All the examples I know from 20th century music where people have rebarred or rewritten their piece and produced multiple versions, and Sacre de Breton is the most famous example, usually they add bar lines. They put more bar lines into the piece to make it more readable and more countable. They do not delete bar lines usually. Or they add bracketed bar lines and say, maybe here's another one that you can use. And so I guess this is the process. That's how I compose it. Then it gets the first performance. The players say, we count, count, count. And then you put in some more bar lines. And in theory, you put them out. In practice, you put them in. Uh, sorry for uh, being the almost same <laughs> again for a second question. Um, uh, yes, subjectively, there's a, for me there's a second uh, elephant in the room, and his, his name is Christopher uh, Hasty. Uh, uh, so I appreciate that you ch choose to chose to to talk about the philosophy of rhythm and meter, but uh, there is the theory also, music theory of rhythm and meter. And there is, uh, 
uh, Christopher Hasty strongly arguing against the distinction between rhythm and meter. And uh, you, you probably are aware that uh, I work with Just in London and uh, Anne and uh, others here too. So we have Just in London here as a regular guest. So there's the, the famous debate about those two uh, springing from uh, Justin's review of Christopher's book. Uh, they, they engaged in direct debate and a lot of it is, uh, is about not only temporality and processuality, but also about the question whether rhythm and meter should and could be uh, differentiated from each other or not. And uh, so the question is, uh, yeah, what's your position on, on Hasty? I, I, I personally see that the Hasty is increasingly used not only in contemporary uh, Western music, where his own background is from, but also in popular music studies and in uh, ethnomusicology. For instance, there's this recent book, Rhythm as Thought and Play, edited by Wolf and uh, Stephen Bloom. Uh, so he's taking making progress in being used in very productive senses in, in a totally uh, against any, totally against the separation of meter and uh, the way you seem to fight for the continuation of working with meter. So do you have uh, relationships to Hasty's theory? How would your scheme relate to his yeah, or his okay. to yours? Well, I don't know him personally. I've read the book, obviously. I mean, I can tell this for eternity or, or for you, a bunch of people, that that really was a problem in writing this book. So the short answer is I don't believe it, what Hasty writes. I'm on Justin Lennon's side to see some things doesn't work out very well. And then while writing the book, I really reread the book of Hasty after I had the first draft of my book to see if my criticism goes too far or I have to, have to put it back at, at some point. And I have put it back at some point because I think it's an, an inspiring text. I think it is really seriously flawed at some theoretical points where you just think it will not work that way. But in other areas, it will work very fine. Um, and some problems you really can solve with these problems and with no other theory. But it's not a general theory that there is always rhythm as meter or meter as rhythm or how, how we, so that there is a collide. So I really think it's still an open, open case um, what to do with it. Um, and uh, I, I, really, I really can say only anecdotally that's a footnote where I try to explain what I think is still right and very good with Hasty. That was, I've really rewritten this a dozen times, or all, all the 47 versions of this footnote existing because I still have not made my mind completely um, what is to be saved from this theory, I think a lot. I am finished with my mind that there is a major piece that possibly cannot be saved and this is his tendency to get very esoteric about rhythm then. That he also uses quotes where rhythm is a healing force that puts manhood in, in a more healthy um, social condition and he writes things in a direction that I really don't like because I know that from these more reactionary earlier texts and I react kind of allergic to that kind of prose. And that's my problem with it. Is there are no further comments or questions? We can, um, we can adjourn to the, the next part, which is uh, reception in the Ritzmo area. I've been told that it won't be a champagne reception, it will be a chocolate reception. So <laughs> if you like that. Um, the next uh, Ritzma seminar is exactly a month from now, uh, so you're very welcome to come back. Uh, but uh, for now, please uh, join me in thanking Julian for an amazing paper. <laughs>